Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie. And on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Edward Hirsch and Kate Daniels discussing 100 Poems to Break Your Heart. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their work to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn about them on our website, booksoup.com, as well as our social media at Booksoup. Our next event is tomorrow, April 20th, with Andy Biersack in conversation with co-author Ryan J. Downey, discussing They Don't Need to Understand, stories of hope, fear, family, life, and never giving in. To submit a question during the event, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like our speakers to answer, please click the Like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. Also, support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click the green purchase button that reads 100 poems directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We'll also be selling these books with signed book plates tonight, so please get them while supplies last. We're selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. A little more about Edward. Edward is a celebrated poet and tire tireless advocate for poetry. He has received numerous awards and fellowships, including a MacArthur Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Ingram Merrill Foundation Award, a Pablo Neruda Presidential Medal, Medal of Honor, the Prix de Rome, and an Academy of Arts and Letters Award. In 2008, he was elected as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. A little more about Kate Daniel. Um, Kate has published many collections of poetry, including In the Months of My Son's Recovery, Three Syllables Describing Addiction, A Walk in Victoria's Secret, Walk in Victoria's Secret, Four Testimonies, and the Niobe Poems. Her work has been anthologized in over 75 volumes, including the best American poetry. She is the Edwin Mims Professor of English and Director of Creative Writing at Vanderbilt University. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Edward and Kate. Enjoy the presentation, thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Hi, Kate. Hi, Ed. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank everyone for coming. Thank you, Maggie and Book Soup for hosting us. Um, I'm glad to be here with you, virtually speaking. Um, I wanted to say something about the book, 100 Poems to Break Your Heart, um, and putting it together. And then I, I asked Kate to join us so she could read her marvelous poem in the book and we could talk about it. Then I asked her to read another poem from the book as well to kind of have a conversation about poems that are meaningful to us. The premise of my book is, well, first of all, I guess I think that American culture is somewhat immature in the way that it handles grief. That as soon as something catastrophic happens to someone, either, either personally or collectively, everyone immediately starts talking to you about healing. And um, they want you to heal and their grief, your grief makes them uncomfortable. And it's not that I'm against healing, I'm all for it, but I believe that you have to mourn before you can heal and you can't forget the heartbreak. And that people wanna um, diagnose the heartbreak, they wanna divide it up into sections and get rid of it. And people begin to feel uncomfortable and even embarrassed or ashamed about their grief. And they begin to go underground with it. That's why there are so many groups where people can meet to talk about it. Poets have a different way of managing this. I believe that a poem is a way of articulating, expressing, and transforming grief into a made thing. I chose poems that were meaningful to me um, in all kinds of ways. Some of them I've known for most of my life, some of them I picked up along the way, and some of them I've known more recently. And they all, each one represents a different kind of grief. In writing about them, first it was choosing the poems, but also I try to write about them. I try to do something that I don't think literary criticism usually does very well. And that's that I tried to write about it as a poem, each poem as a poem, as a made thing. And I think literary criticism sometimes can do that very well. But I also tried to remember that it's a human document. And I don't think literary criticism usually does that very well. What I mean by that is that the poems that I've chosen 
um, are not mere games. People are not just screwing around. They're not just linguistic events. People are writing about things that are very meaningful to them in their lives. And in writing about these poems, I try to honor the poet as a maker and the poem as a made thing, while also remembering that a human being made this poem to try and express, articulate, wrestle with their own grief and their own feeling. And I tried to keep that feeling and that human presence present at all times. Now, sometimes they ask, people ask me if um, grief, writing about so many grief-stricken poems was depressing to me. Um, and in fact, it's not. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but in my opinion, when I read something that's terribly sad, it somehow makes me feel more connected to the human community rather than less connected. And I believe that the premise of poetry is basically social because language is a social act. So for example, I write about a poem by John Clare, a marvelous poem called I Am, which he wrote in a mental hospital in the 19th century. And the poem begins, I am, yet what I am none cares or knows. My friends forsake me like a memory lost. I am the self consumer of my woes. Even when he says that he's the self-consumer of his woes, he also makes the rhythm work and rhymes the poem. And it's not a diary entry. The fact that he's raking it rhyme suggests that he believes there's a reader or a listener on the horizon. Now, that may not mean that he's companioned by the people around him. And he may not be writing for the people in the mental hospital or even the people who read the Bedford local newspaper in England in 1848 when the poem appeared. Um, but he believed that on the horizon was someone who could understand him. And I believe that that reaching out to some future listener, that some future reader, some other person uh, is essentially a hopeful act. It suggests that someone can understand and that however inarticulate or grief stricken or broken the poem comes from, the place that it comes from, the fact that it's been made into something in language suggests some kind of hopefulness on the horizon. And it's that combination of deep feeling and hopefulness that encouraged me to put these poems together and to start explaining how they worked and to bring together poems that I felt had not been understood very well um, or that had been especially meaningful to me and in many cases, poems that were not known very well from around the world. And bringing those poems to a, to a community of readers was important to me. And that was the, that's the premise for the book. So one of the poems um, that I found really extraordinary and deeply meaningful was a poem that I read in a, in a, in a fairly new book by Kate Daniels. And so I decided to include it. And Kate, you'd do me a great favor if you'd be willing to read it. Yeah, I'd be glad to read it. But before I read it, I just want to thank Maggie and, Beck and Book Soup for having us. And thank you, Ed, for inviting me. But I also want to say something about the book, because it's, it's a really wonderful book. And I was so glad uh, to have the premise for it. Um, Ed and I think a lot alike in terms of how we think about poems in terms of how we think about the role of grief and mourning in poems, the ability of poetry to manage, contain grief and other strong emotions. Um, one of the things that, that I do in my poetry writing workshops always, at whatever level I'm teaching, whether it's beginning poets who've never written a complete poem in their life or whether it's very talented graduate students, is I have them for the very first class bring a poem to orally present to the class and I say, it has to be a heart stabber. And I'm talking about the kind of poem that Ed is talking about, is, is putting together in this book. So one of, it was just wonderful to me, somehow I had lost track in the pandemic that I actually was gonna have a poem in this collection. And then all of a sudden I got the, the book and, and, and saw that there I was in there. Um, and one of the things that was so marvelous, that is so marvelous to me about this collection is how many poets are in here who are on my personal list of not just heartbreaking poets, but heart stabbing poets, and how many actual poems are poems that, that are ones that are, again, in my sort of personal archive. 
Um, I also love the way, Ed, you've done the commentary on the poems. Uh, conversational, but speaking to readers who um, appreciate poetry, may or may not be very highly trained in it, but speaking person to person. You just said something that struck me very much. You said, uh, writing about these poems, not just about the poems themselves, but about the fact that a person made this poem. And that's very evident in all these commentaries that, that you put together. It's just, it's a really wonderful collection, so. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. So I'm gonna read this poem, it's really short. Um, it's in a collection uh, that came out uh, two years ago called In the Months of My Son's Recovery. And uh, I have to say at the beginning that my poems um, tend to be very autobiographical. They're not totally autobiographical, but very close. This one is very close. Um, as you're gonna see, it's a poem that has to do with the effect of um, uh, drug addiction on a family. And uh, it, um, I read this poem with the permission of all my family members um, who may find themselves represented in the poem. <clears throat> so this is called The Addict's Mother Birth Story. She wasn't watching when they cut him out. C-section, you know, green drape obscuring the mound of ripened belly they extracted him from. He spilled out squalling, already starving. Still stitching her up, they fastened him to her breast so he could feed. There he rooted for the milk so lustful in his sucking that weeping roses grew from the edges of her nipples. For weeks they festered there, blooming bloody trails anew each and every time he made a meal of her. I know what you're thinking, but he was her child. She had to let him do that to her. So, Kate, you gave birth not so recently. Um, <laughs> How can you tell? <laughs> but um, so I'm interested in in this the 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 depth of the, the amount of time that you return to this because the poem has tremendous immediacy, um, and yet it's also written with the perspective of much later experience. Yeah. Um, I wonder how you decided that you would you would write this poem. Well, I mean, in general, um, maternity has been a major subject for me. Um, so I've written a lot about the maternal experience, all different phases of it. Um, I haven't written so much. My, my kids are older. They're in their 20s and 30s now. Um, but uh, I have to provide a, an autobiographical context. My family was, shall we say, visited by the opioid epidemic. And one of my offspring um, at the age of um, uh, 21, uh, turned out to be, to the shock of the entire family, addicted to both um, uh, opioids, later heroin, and, and alcohol. So I was um, very fortunate. I was shocked beyond belief. Um, it's, it's, it, I can't even express the, the, the total um, disappearance of my ability to function, having receiving this news. Um, luckily for me, I was taken within, literally within 24 hours of finding this out to um, an Al-Anon group, which is a 12-step support group for family and friends of people who, um, uh, family and friends of addicts. And that began to sort of uh, help me manage and contain the fear that I was uh, all of a sudden a victim of. Um, over a long, uh, quite a large number of months, I began to sort of soak in some of the lessons of 12 step, which are really very sort of Zen like and a lot about mindfulness. But one of them was uh, about the concept of enabling. And this is an, a behaviors in which family members of addicted people believe they're acting in the best interests of their loved one and try to help. But in fact, this behavior in some way is undermining or even supporting the addictive behavior. So this is really, this is a poem that I think about as, as being about enabling. I want to ask you a question about it as a poem. 
Um, okay. And that's that um, one of the things you did, it's a decision that Tom Gunn also made in an extraordinary poem that he wrote about his mother's suicide called The Guest Poker. This is about giving birth, but you do tell it not from your own point of view, but from a third person. And I wondered about the third person point of view and how you think it operates in this poem. Well, I wrote, uh, I think this, this book has about 20 of these poems in there. And um, some of them are in first person and some of them are in third person. And when I wrote them, I mean, often as poets do, when I'm revising a draft of a poem, I'll switch the voice just to see what happens, you know, the narration to see. Um, but it became apparent to me that some of these poems were too hot for me to put in the first person, that I could not get any distance or any detachment from the, the emotional core of the poem in order to fashion it into something, into a made product. You know, I couldn't do it. So I had to back up from it. So the third person allowed me to back up, particularly in this poem. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I wonder if you think that in general, I mean, obviously the poem is personal, but it seems to me maybe there's also something impersonal in it by the third person because you're willing to take a look at it from the outside or from the third person perspective. I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's, I, I can't, I can't even, even written in the third person and sitting on Zoom and having you ask me a question like that, it's really hard to get distance from this particular poem because it just yeah. hot wires me to the nexus of, you know, emotions and experience that it came from. Um, I tried to keep the language very dry and detached. So that would be about as close as I could think of as getting to impersonal, but it doesn't feel at all impersonal to me, particularly when it breaks the, the boundary between the reader and the text by reaching out, by saying, I know what you're thinking and speaking to the reader, you know, immediately. Okay. I wanted to ask you about there. There are two moments like that that are really striking to me. One is she wasn't watching when they cut him out. C-section, you know. I mean, that's pretty chatty to the rear, you know, just who knows? Well, now yeah. I know because you're sort of just talking to me. And I, I mean, the idea is to take in the reader as a kind of confidant. Uh, yeah. And uh Yes, but also something about a kind of familiarity with birth processes and a, a familiarizing of female experience. I mean, that's a big, I'm, I'm an old unreconstructed baby boomer feminist. That's the project of my work, you know, got to keep second wave feminism alive and poetry till the day I die. So there's something about that, about sort of familiarizing or bringing into visibility aspects of female experience that strike me that I, I seem to have a resentful feeling about that haven't been given their rightful place in American poetry, something like that. That's probably more what, what that C-section, you know. It's got is. a bit of an edge. Bit of an edge, yeah, yeah. always a bit of an edge. And how about the moment, I thought it was odd when I read it, I was very struck by it. I know what you're thinking. How do you know what I'm thinking? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, that's about, shame and the experience of going through um, this kind of thing. I was profoundly ashamed, not just as a human being, but as a mother, that this was my experience, that this was happened, this had happened to me. I had always been very invested in my mothering and probably, you know, too proud of it. And so this was quite a humbling experience for me. Um, and I did feel very accused and very marked. Um, and so that's where that, that comes from. Um, until I went to 12 step and began and realized I had joined a huge club that just cut across all demographics. Um, I, I, I did not realize until then the extent to which I had held a lot of stereotypes about people with substance use disorder and who their family members were. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, maybe that's part of the impersonality of it. There I'm inhabiting people external to this situation and imagining what they're thinking and that they're judging. Because I, before this happened to me, I was one of those people. I was judging. I mean, that's what strikes me most strongly about that line is 
that, I mean, you don't know, you, you feel, I mean, you're judging yourself. I feel that's where, that, that's what, that's what I think is happening. The projection onto the reader is some self-judgment there. Absolutely. I think your poem, I mean, I've always contended that it, it takes skill to write poetry, but it also takes courage. And I believe that your poem shows a lot of courage because you're willing to face something that's very upsetting, very uncomfortable. And, and also you're not trying to put yourself in a good light. You're willing to turn the knife against yourself. Yeah, I, I think that's true. That's always been a part of what I've done in poems. Um, I'm not sure why, um, but it, it has seemed to me, for me, the most worthwhile thing to pursue. Um, I wrote a lot of these particular poems because this this poem is part of a you know a, a whole group. I wrote a lot of these poems. Um, I couldn't start writing them until about two years after this situation commenced. And I wrote many of them up in Wellfleet on Cape Cod in this little tiny um, A-frame cottage, looking out at a salt marsh, which was very soothing. I was I was alone most of the time during the day. In the evenings, I'd see friends for meals and things like that. And you're right, it was it was terrifying to write these poems. And there were times, this was one of them in which I got a kind of a somatic jolt at the end, but there were others that were even more terrifying than this. And I can remember one in particular that when I got to the end, I'm a fast typer and I type first drafts of poems onto the computer. And when I got to the last line, it was so shocking to me what had come out that I, I literally screamed. And, and ran out of the little cottage and had to sort of run around for a while to, to get the feeling out of my body. Um, so I don't think of myself as particularly courageous, but I do, I am cognizant that there's some kind of um, practice of mental fortitude that, I, that happens in bringing my poems to the page that I'm committed to. I mean, I was aware this was part of a sequence, and when you but when you pull it out separately, it's very striking because you are projecting. I mean, you are calling yourself the addict's mother, and you're projecting addiction. It's clear that you're rethinking your whole experience as a mother from scratch in light of what's happened to you. And it seems to me that the projection back of this idea of addiction into all the way back to birth and, and breastfeeding is very startling and striking. Yeah, and you can't really see it in this poem, but a theme in these poems is, um, is, is a dual diagnosis, which is a medical diagnosis of co-occurring addiction and mental disorder. So this was, um, you're right, it was, a, it was a going back to the origins to try to figure out where did it start? oh my God, maybe it started right at birth. I mean, for instance, one of the things that I found out afterwards after my child had been um, diagnosed with bipolar, just previous to, just uh, slightly before all of this happened, was that um, it's believed that uh, one of the early life symptoms of bipolar disorder, which is very hard to diagnose in children, might be newborn infants who sleep an inordinate amount of, t of time. And this particular child who grew up to have this um, this life narrative slept 22 hours the first day that we were home from the hospital. And for the next weeks, slept anywhere from 18 to 20 hours. I kept calling the doctor. And the doctor said, well, this is just what newborns do. But it's not what all newborns do. So that's part of what I was doing in this poem. You're right, going all the way back to the origins, how, how I'm, I connected in my behaviors as a mother, how am I connected in terms of my, the genetic inheritance I passed on to this child? Very self-accusatory, yes. To me also, there's something, it, it has a kind of doom feeling at the end that I, I identify with being a parent, not, not just with being a mother, which is that um, he was her child. She had to let him do that to her. I mean, there's something doomed about the two of them from the beginning, but really there's something doomed about us as parents from the beginning because we, whatever we're enabling, we're also, we're doomed to be part of it because we're so deeply fused and connected with our, with our children. And so it seemed to me that that, that was a sort of gutsy, painful acceptance. Yeah. I, I mean, I would never have gotten there without going to these, going to Al-Anon, going to 12-step support groups because I, 
my sort of basic parenting was, you know, I just, I was, have always been ecstatic about my kids and thought they were the best kids on the planet earth. And my goal in life was to help them achieve whatever they could achieve and to relieve them of misery and suffering and, you know, relieve, make sure they didn't have any of the suffering and misery that I had growing up. And, uh, you know, that doesn't work when you're dealing with, uh, this kind of situation. Um, Maybe it doesn't work in any kind of a situation, but it was a hard lesson to learn. It, it's certainly not helpful. I mean, that sort of boasting about I have perfect kids that you get a lot when you when you have a child and you you're you're in school, you know, going through school with all kinds of other parents. It's certainly not very helpful to people who have troubled children, and it's not very helpful in poetry. And I think one of the reasons that people turn to poetry is for things that are otherwise elided or that get passed over or difficult truths. And um, the experience of, of child, of having children and being a parent has been not been written about with great significance nearly enough in my opinion. And I think bringing that forward, the truth of it a, a, with a kind of ruthless perspective is tremendously helpful to, to other people and especially to other parents. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think you'll probably agree with what I'm about to say, but you know that I'm very interested in psychoanalysis and that one of the things that I do is I teach writing at a psychoanalytic center uh, institute in um, Washington, D.C. I've done that for a long time. Um, and I, uh, I write a lot about the convergences between poetry and psychoanalysis. And one of the things that I like to say about it is that um, it takes courage to enter a psychoanalysis and it takes courage to write a poem. It doesn't even matter if it's a poem about something that's difficult or painful to write about. It just takes courage to write a poem, to make that kind of commitment to accuracy in language and beauty in language. But one of the things I like to say to audiences and also to my students is, if you don't wanna hear the news from your unconscious, do not go into psychoanalysis or try writing a poem because that's, it's hotwired to the center of all that stuff. That's I mean, I, I think the thing they have in common is you're supposed to go to where it's most painful. In, or, instead of avo avoiding it, you go towards it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. First responders. First, first responders. <laughs> um, um, I asked you to choose another poem. Are you, are you okay to move on? Yeah. Um, I asked you to choose another poem from the book that you thought was meaningful, and I wonder what you have in mind. The John Keats fragment, the little short one. Am I going to read that or are you going to read it? Why, why don't you? Okay. So this is a little, uh, very short fragment um, by John Keats, um, written in uh, 1819, not long before he died. Um, here it is. This living hand now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again. And thou be conscience calmed. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. Well, that is, so I first heard this poem. I was probably maybe 23 years old. I had studied Red Keats along with probably in a survey course with the, you know, the rest of the romantics as an undergraduate. And I was, I, it's kind of embarrassing now to admit, but I was not in love with the romantics as an undergraduate. I was very much an American literature uh, person and I was reading absolutely everything. So I, I consumed them, but I did not stop and love them in the way I later came to love them. But I was quite shocked when I was introduced to this poem. The poet Gregory Orr recited it to me in a conference that I was having with him. I was doing a master's in literature after I'd done my, my BA and I was taking an independent study with him and he was trying, I don't remember now what he was trying to illustrate to me, but he, he quoted this poem to me and um, it just blew me out of the water. And what 
blew me out of the water was the immediacy of it. And the reason I chose it, because it, for me, it relates to the poem of mine, you know, the addict's mother birth story. Um, that moment where he reaches out of the poem at the very end and says, see, here it is. I hold it towards you. Um, so that was something that that instant was an instant object lesson to me. And so you can, you know, one of those moments where you go as a young poet, you can do that in a poem. You can do that. Um, I want to learn how to do that. Um, the other one does, though, was and, and maybe this is where you said we're going to disagree about this poem before. But maybe this is um, the other thing. It's 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 so psychologically complex. So it strikes me as a, I, I have always understood it to be a poem that Keats was addressing to Fanny Braun, whom he was desperately, you know, trying to bring to bed before he, he perished of his tuberculosis. And so I saw it as a kind of psychological manipulation. You know, you're going to be sorry if you don't give yourself to me before I die. You're going to think about it afterwards. You're gonna have it on your conscience. So you could do this now and be conscience calm. And again, that, clarified something to me. I could see in my early baby poems that one of the things I was most interested in was the representation of psychological states and the exploration of those in poetry, which I think is what's happening in this poem. We don't really disagree. Okay. The only thing I the only thing I'd say about it is that I mean that the context of the poem is that Keats was writing a long poem called The Cap and Bells. Yeah. And and it's kind of a superficial poem. He was writing, you know, he wrote these Spencerian stanzas. He was trying to make money. Um, yeah. The poem is kind of light and not a great success. And then in the margins, he writes this thing. And, and no one even knows really if it's even a poem exactly. It didn't have a title. It was just in the margin. But it, it's, it's so desolate, so desperate, so urgent. And it, that it kind of articulates something incredible about Keats, but also about poetry, because he so much wants to come off the page. He uh -huh. so much wants his hand to the living hand that's still alive, that he knows won't be alive later. He so much wants to reach you. Now, it may be Fanny Braun, it may be someone else, but it is a kind of weird bargain almost that he wants to make with the reader. Like he, he goes, I will, you know, I you will con calm your conscience, but I will take your life yeah. by trading places with you. And then he goes, here's his hand. See, here it is. It's an incredibly human moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you use the word desolate. Uh, to me, it, I mean, I have, I, I cannot take it out of the Fanny Braun context. So I see it as a poem of seduction. And in mm -hmm. that way, it's, I mean, that's part of the, it's haunting, but it's it's also you know you just you just tweak it a little bit. It's really creepy. I mean, it's yeah, really yeah, creepy. yeah, yeah. It's predatorial in a way, and um, but it's very convincing psychologically to me. Um, desperate, I hear that desolate. You know, I, you know, maybe you're right about that. Yeah. Um, but I think that the you, I can see why you read it as Fanny Braun, but it's also it is in the poem indeterminate. Yes, it is absolutely. And it doesn't save. I mean, there are poems where he calls her Fanny, um, and and is speaking to her directly. And so it's it's possible that he's talking to her, but it's also that he's talking to some other person. Um, that, in any case, he urgently wants to communicate with you, and as as human touch. And the I think the thing that's so I guess the reason I was saying desolate, but really desperate is more accurate is he's he's so he knows he's going to die yeah he knows the hand the handwriting the hand that he's reaching towards you is living now but it won't be living later and that's what i think is so powerful about it is this is the last moment that he can reach his hand towards you because he knows that the, the physical hand that he's holding out w won't be alive. That and, and it's a kind of metonymy because the living hand stands for the person. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Don't you say something in your comments about his hands and his constant looking at his hands? Yes. I, I, I say that um, this is one of the first ways that he knew. Lee Hunt said that Keats often looked at his hand 
which was faded and swollen in the veins and say it was the hand of a man of 50. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Keats knew he was aging by the way he'd look at his hand and he was so young, it was startling to him that it was a sort of indication. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the in the 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 big the huge canon of of poems of seduction, though, it's also there's something really wonderfully. Um, I mean, it's wonderful. Here's a guy who's on almost on his deathbed, and mm -hmm. he's still infused with you know um, libidinal urges. Is that's how, that's how I read the poem. That's one of the things that's interesting to me about it. It's the hand that's going to be dead soon, but there's still this you know, urgent libido and life force that's in him as a young man that wants to be, that wants to be fulfilled, that's looking for its object. I find that interesting. When you read it, you can't pretend that Keats wanted to die or that Keats was ready to die or that Keats was accepting his own death. All the sort of sentimentalities about Keats that, that, that people have said doesn't, don't seem to be true. I mean, this poem is, is creepy and enraged. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And it, it is not accepting that he's he's just calmly going to his death. On the contrary, he knows he's dying too soon. He knows he's being cut off. He knows he's losing the great love of his life. And it's unbearable to him. And he wants to sort of he wants to trade. He wants he wants to trade for human life. He wants to take the place of someone living and so he can live. Yep. Yep. I think it's fine. It's just a it's just a little fragment, um, but it it speaks to me with just tremendous urgency. And one of the things that I, I find moving about it is that Keats is so I mean, I consider him the most lovable of all English poets. Um, but the poems are so monumental. I mean, to, uh, to Autumn may be the most perfect poem in English, but there's so much commentary around it, and there's so much thinking about the odes that you kind of lose John Keats, the person. Yeah. And, and here this, he's the person. Yeah. Here he's the person. Yeah. yeah. Very, very much so. so. So I opened the questions. Would you like me to read a question that's directed right at you? Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> Years ago at the Santa Monica Poetry Conference, Ed asserted that, quote, poetry is not personal. What, <laughs> what did he mean by that? And does he, and does he still believe it? I don't know. I have to ask him. He's he says a lot of shit. I don't understand him sometimes. Um, I don't know. I really don't know what I meant when I said poetry is not personal, because I think it is personal. But what I th I suppose that well, I, I don't know what I meant then. But I could say if I said that now, what I would mean by that, um, and that's that I, I first of all I don't believe that's true. I think it is personal. But I do think that there is something cold in poets or what i would call impersonal um you know in order in other words there is a willingness to document your own experience and to turn it into poetry and that is not always an appealing quality or trait what i mean by that is you are willing to ruthlessly expose your own life in order to make something and um you're not putting a gloss on it. You're exposing other people sometimes. I mean, you were very careful to say you wrote that and you had permission from your family. Um, that you are, I mean, I like something Cheswell Miwa said, which I think is very funny. When a writer is born into a family, the family's finished. <laughs> That's I think it's funny. And so, I mean, I think poets, you know, take great, pride in their in their work and they 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 take glory in themselves and their great their great qualities but i think there's also something a little cold and ruthless in willing in your willingness to look at things really hard and to turn it into art because no matter how personal it is in terms of what you're writing about when you write a poem you inevitably start thinking as you did Kate in your poem about whether to write it in the first person or the third person. And you start thinking about line breaks and you start thinking about whether to capitalize the first letter of the, of the line. And you start thinking about metaphor and you start thinking about how to address the reader. 
you inevitably, what I mean by this is you inevitably engage poetic problems. There's no way around that. And, and so you can't pretend that you're only thinking about the human presence, the human story, and what it meant to you, because you're also thinking about trying to make a poem. And I find that consoling. I find it heartening. But it also means you're not just thinking about the people that you love and the people in your life. You're also thinking about how to make something that you think will last and will speak to people who don't know you. And so that's what I, I suppose I mean by saying it's impersonal or cold or not simply diaristic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with just about everything you said. It struck me as you were talking, though, that part of uh, that term ruthlessness, which you use a lot, I've heard you use it a lot over the years, it has something to do with the kind of detachment that we were talking about when we were talking about my poem and backing up from the poem. Um, it's a it's a it's a technique on the page, but it's also a method of emotional self-control that allows you to actually get to the point where you can begin to bring the poem to the page. Um, so yeah, that kind of that always that that self-analytical eye uh, that that poets have that maybe Emily Dickinson had better and more intensely than than anyone else. Um, it's it's essential to the process, but it's also to be part of the the one of the many paradoxes about poetry. Um, poetry is um, maybe not personal in the way that it becomes an object or a gift made of words that we can give to someone else, but it's intensely and completely personal because of where it comes from and the fact that it wouldn't come into being if we could not bore in in a ruthless way to those. Um, yeah. Opinions. I mean, I, I don't want to be misleading here. I think, I mean, this, the hundred poems I chose, I think are intensely personal. I, 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 intensely personal. I would not say that they're not personal. What I would say is that in every case, someone made a decision to write a poem and that sometimes the poem meant that it was writing a Petrarchan sonnet. Sometimes, I mean, it took, John, it took Tom Gunn 50 years to write about his mother's suicide. Yeah. And what he said about it was um, deciding to write about it in the third person made it possible for him to, to, to write about it in a way that he'd never been able to yeah. do it before. Yeah. And so um, Joseph Brodsky had an idea of, of contending forces in poetry. He was writing about Robert Frost, but I think it fits for other poems too. The contending forces of grief and reason. And that the grief is the feeling, the reason is the sensibility of the maker, um, presenting something, shaping something, making something in relationship to that. And, um, and, and, and I found a lot of these poems have this element of, of reason or conscientiousness of a maker being imposed or structured around intensely personal experiences. Yeah. Yeah, I've sometimes thought one of the hardest things or, or most discomforting things uh, as a poet is when, and, and I think you talked about this at your fairly recent reading at Vanderbilt, Ed, um, is you, it's possible as a poet to write long enough um, to develop a deep enough practice so that in the moment when you're experiencing your life in moments of catastrophe or overwhelming affect, you can actually feel that ruthless position that you enter and you start backing up and you're observing it as if you're a character. So there's part of you that's that's in the moment and is is getting the full sort of flush of whatever the affect is, so the other part is backing up and thinking about how am I going to Put this into a poem. How am I going to make a poem out of this? Chris Freeman is asking if the last poem in your book is is called Detachment. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Which I think I, I think the question is a point, right? I mean, it makes the point. Yeah. About the kind of detachment that it that it that, that it takes. Yeah. But I think it's this quality of detachment that that makes these poems the willingness of poets to try to generalize from their own experience. 
um, and to make something of their own experience and to make something of their own agon. Yeah. And th that's, and, and, and there's such a wide range of poets, but um, even someone, I mean, for me, I chose a poem by, by Tennyson that has, a, from In Memoriam, that has just an incredible homoerotic element um, that, I mean, it is, he, he did sort of invent this meter for In Memoriam, but the poem is just filled with longing for his lost friend. Yeah. And I find that again and again that in the poems, this balance that you have in your poem between the most intense feeling and then some kind of psychological and formal understanding of what what the what the being applied to the experience. Yeah, yeah. I like to I like to put those two together. I'm just smiling because I was remembering an experience I had many years ago teaching up at Bennington uh, in the MFA program in the early years, and they used to put us we team taught, and I taught with a poet named Stephen Sandy. Who did you ever know Stephen Sandy? So I, I met, him, met him once. You will know immediately that our poetry could not, we were at opposite ends of the scale. He was a, a very precise, very talented, very wonderful, formal poet, um, very um, restrained in his expression of affect in his poems. Um, very, he was American, but very, my, my mother's English, so I think I'm allowed to say this, very much had the British stiff upper lip, you know, sort of approach to expressing strong feeling. But I was in my sort of hairiest feminist phase and all over the place. And so we were often sort of battling in workshop over the students' poems. And one day he grew so exasperated with me. He was the sweetest, gentlest man. But he drew back from the table and he said, Kate, all I can say is that we all love each other. We just, <laughs> we just mustn't say so in poems. <laughs> And I, I mean, again, I think this is one of the wonderful things because he would, he, his poems to him were extremely personal. They came from very personal places, but this is part of the marvelous capaciousness of poetry and its ability to include everything that the personal expands in, in, in different forms, according to the, the different poets. Um, but you might say that he screened out too much. For, for my taste, but you know, for my taste. But I put too much, I had too much on the plate for him, for his taste. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, I, I was really struck that um, by the, the Wordsworth poem that I begin the book with, Surprised by Joy, because Wordsworth can often sound like he's speaking from the podium um, and he can sort of take the high ground. But this poem is to me, this sonnet is, is, is sort of a different side of Wordsworth. Because he's walking in the uh, uh, he's walking in London, and he sees something really marvelous, and he turns to tell his companion how great it is to exclaim, and he realizes she isn't there, it's his daughter, and he'd forgotten that she died. Yeah. And so his great poem of joy is also his great poem of sorrow. Yeah. Th that was an extraordinary insight to me by Wordsworth that he was willing to, to see and to convict himself then um, for being surprised by joy and being pulled back into life and forgetting that the most beloved person of his life had passed away and that he'd been dragged and the, and the process of death had been to be, that he had been dragged back into life. And I wanted the book to begin under that sign because it took a kind of, um, quality of psychological insight and formal precision to be able to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything to add to that. I agree with that. Um, I mean, I, for me, Wordsworth is always full of feeling. I don't have that. I mean, I understand there's passages that, yeah. that have rhetoric in them, yeah. but yeah. he moves me constantly. Maggie was asking me, beforehand about what what how you decide to make an anthology and, and what you put in and what you leave out. And I mean, it's one thing to say, it depends on the kind of anthology and how, if, if it's a historical anthology or chronological anthology, or if you're doing an anthology, American poetry of the 1950s, I mean, you want an anthology to be capacious, but in this particular anthology, 
100 Poems to Break Your Heart, the bar was very high because literally I had to find poems and choose poems. I had, of course, many more than I could choose, but literally they had to be poems that I found heartbreaking. And I find there are many great poems that I really admire, but are not, there are a lot of things that poems can do. They don't all have to be heartbreaking. They're all not even meant to be heartbreaking. But I was looking for poems that are particularly heartbreaking and that also had something to, that I could say about them as poems um, that were also meaningful to me and that I could help bring them forward and bring out something in them to readers. So part of, I think, what you're, what you're doing in anthology is you're trying to bring forth things that people know and things that people don't know um, and poems that you can live with. But I think the purpose of any anthology, the, the theme of the anthology or the structure of the anthology will determine a lot of what you can do with it inside of it. Here, it has a high threshold because the poems have to be of great emotional import. And there are really many great poems that are not, that don't, that are, that don't do that. You put them in order of the composition, date of composition of the poem, right? Not the not the dates of the poet, right? Yes, that I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't positive about what how to how to handle that, but that's what I decided to do. It creates for some anomalies, but it seemed to be pinpointing because I was focusing on the poem and not the poet. Um, I mean, I did bring a biographical story to each of the poems, but because I was trying to pinpoint a particular poem, I decided to arrange it chronologically. For a long time, I thought I might arrange it thematically, and then I found that troublesome. Yeah. Um, too many poems, there was too much overlap in the kinds of grief, and I didn't like reducing the grief to one thing, and I didn't like segmenting them off. So I just decided the easiest thing to do would be to try and pinpoint when the poems were written, and to let the sweep of different kinds of sorrowful feelings um, shape shape the anthology. Yeah, it's it's an interesting approach to take. So um, we are just about at the end. Could I ask you to choose one more poem just to kind of lead us out as a sort of a benediction? That would be a pleasure. Um, So this is a poem by Gerald Stern called The Dancing. Um, and all I, I won't explain it because I write about it in the book, but what I will say is that it seems like it's a completely personal poem that turns out also to be a historical one. And that it's a poem of great ecstasy that turns out also to be a poem of sorrow. And so it transforms its nostalgia into something much more resonant, I would say. So it's really, it's an extraordinary poem to me. It's called The Dancing. In all these rotten shops, in all this broken furniture and wrinkled ties and baseball trophies and coffee pots, I've never seen a post-war Philco with the automatic eye, nor heard Ravel's bolero the way I did in 1945 in that tiny living room on Beechwood Boulevard nor danced as I did then, my knives all flashing, my hair all streaming, my mother red with laughter, my father cupping his left hand under his armpit, doing the dance of old Ukraine, the sound of his skin half drum, half fart, the world at last a meadow, the three of us whirling and singing, the three of us screaming and falling, as if we were dying, as if we could never stop, in 1945, in Pittsburgh, beautiful, filthy Pittsburgh, home of the evil melons, 5,000 miles away from the other dancing in Poland and Germany. Oh, God of mercy. Oh, wild God. So that's a hell of a sentence. Yeah. There's a funny moment in it. When he can't resist, he goes home with the evil melons. <laughs> he, <laughs> he can like, never 
miss that moment. <laughs> he can't get over. I mean, he's got this old grudge from Pittsburgh. He just can't can't resist like giving him a little shot from Pittsburgh. But the thing about the poem, aside from its ecstatic feeling and the drive of its sentences, that uh, the, just the recognition that at first it's just dropped in in 1945, and then later becomes so significant. And you realize that the family in, that's dancing in Pittsburgh over the end of the war is tied to the family in Poland and Germany that's, that's dancing about being liberated from the concentration camps. And then it turns into a prayer. I mean, it really is remarkable the way the poem turns. Yeah, it's an extraordinary poem. It's still, every time I hear it or read it, I still have that somatic response to it. It's just how it collapses the distance at the end. It's just an extraordinary formal trick that he- How did he do it? How did he do it? Yeah, yeah, how did he do it? Because he's Jerry Stern, that's how he did it. That's right, so. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Maggie. Hi. For hosting us. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, this is a wrap on our presentation. Uh, thank you again to our guests and to all of you who tuned in this evening. Um, we greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Please support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. Just click the green purchase button that reads 100 poems directly below the viewer screen. Remember, they will come with signed book plates. Um, if you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, please make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Have a great evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Ed. Thank, Thank you. you Ed. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.